Welcome to another episode of Bringing Down the Grindhouse, a podcast where we discuss horror in media. And tonight, do you want to play a game, motherfucker? If you want to play a game, join us as we dive into Spiral. I'm Mitch. Oh, from the Book of Saw. So it, it does have a, long, a long title like title. that. It is Spiral from the Book of Saw. I'm Mitch. I'm Mur. I'm just Steve. And I'm Jonathan. Uh, yes, just like there are fish historians, oh, well, I am your saw historian for the night. <laughs> Boo this man. Boo this man. <laughs> Boo. <No. laughs> yeah, Chris Rock's in this movie, too. It's pretty cool. <laughs> it is pretty cool, actually. We'll talk about it. This well, is his first horror movie. Yeah, I guess so, huh? Yep. He, I mean, <laughs> go ahead and go. go. Just go straight into it. Go into the... Because there's a lot of production notes for this. There's a lot of interviews that were done about this because he was very adamant about making this movie. He wanted to branch out. So Sp- Spiral or the book from the book of Saw came out 2021 when it was originally supposed to be released in 2020, but due to the pandemic, it got pushed back a year later. It is directed by Darren Lynn Bozeman, who is no, has done other Saw movies. He was originally on Saw five and six and then did Jigsaw eventually. And then written by Josh Stolberg and Peter Goldfinger, who also wrote Jigsaw prior uh, to this movie. It's the ninth Saw film, which is crazy because I can't, I can't believe they made nine. Dude, those least. middle ones don't exist in my mind. They're like up great. until up until like three or four. Yep. When Jigsaw is still alive and then he eventually dies, uh, those are like the best ones. If you can call some of them the best ones, because it really gets uh, like just about the gore at some point. The first one was definitely like this is something you had never seen before pretty arts art house yeah they honestly. wanted to, well it was made by these uh these dudes who only had a, a single room to work in and they were trying to submit it to a festival with a limited budget so they made something out of that oh you mean I, our boys lee winnell yes. and james it, wan i think i think i stopped watching saw movies when there was no more danny glover in it because <laughs> danny glover was around in the true, saw movies actually, for a bit one, like, like, I think the, like the later ones after the first one anyway yeah i want to say I think he died in like the second or third. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that would yeah, make sense. Something like that. It was the shotgun, the shotgun above the, uh, Yo, above the door that, was, that got that him, I believe. Partner. Yeah. That was oh, really it was his fun. partner that got it. It's he, been a while. He, he got a knife to the neck, though. I know that. Yeah. Yeesh. Yeesh. <laughs> uh, I'll go into production notes, and then we can just talk about shit. This movie stars Chris Rock in his first horror movie role, as well as Max Mingala, a new newcomer actor here and there from the British area. Of the world. You mean he's from Britain? He's from Britain, <laughs> but he actually does a pretty good American accent. I hope we have fans who are like, what the fuck? Yeah, <laughs> like, actually from Sorry British. to any of our British listeners. It's okay. We, we do our Yeehaw fan, too. Yeah. Our yeah we, got, we got our Limey fans. We got our Yeehaw fans. <laughs> oh! Oh! <laughs> oh, man. So he, he plays Detective, uh, Detective Shank. He's the new rookie cop that's going to be Chris Rock's partner. And then we have Marcel Nichols. She plays Angela, the head of the... Homicide department. Excuse you, that's Marisol. Marisol. <laughs> yeah. She was a TV actor. And yeah. so eventually she, she got a big break for this movie. She kind of looks like Cher. She, she kind of looks kinda like, look Cher. like Cher. Actually. She was also an, uh, one of the girls that gets killed in Scream 2. Dang, I forgot about that. So come in full circle. Oh, oh wait. Oh, she's, she's also. Oh, my God. She's also in Riverdale. Ew. Yeah. Ew is Isn't correct. Isn't she like one of the moms? I think she is. I, I have to admit, I did watch the first season of it. So, well, yeah, every, you gotta at least watch a few I gotta episodes give it a of chance. it. Yeah, yeah, it kind of blows my mind that that's Archie. The, the, the why comic. is Archie ripped? <laughs> yeah, what the hell? Oh, weird. I didn't even think about that. Um, and then we got uh, Samuel L. Motherfucking Jackson. I, lo- I love that he's just himself and everything he's in. <laughs> Pretty much, especially in this movie. He's yeah, very much. Just chilling. For years, they were making jokes. Watch Samuel L. Jackson just do a Saw movie and be like, you want to play games, motherfucker? And they did it. <laughs> oh my That's God. true. They, they actually did. did. <laughs> um, supposedly, on the first day of shooting, uh, the the director, Bowsman, basically was just like, all right, Samuel Jackson, I need you to be like right here doing this scene. And, he, and then Samuel L. Jackson basically said, no, I'm not going to do that. And uh, he said it so sternly that Bowsman like, fucking his his butthole clench is what he said in the interview he's like dude but he's like he told him again to do it and samuel jackson's like okay i thought you were gonna be one of those pushover directors good to know that you stand up for yourself 
Dang. Can you imagine getting tested like that on your set by like some Samuel actors? Samuel L. Jackson? Motherfucking Jackson. I mean, I think my butthole would have oh clenched too. I, I, yeah. yeah. Fuck that. I would have lost my shit. I'm like, who the fuck do you think you are? <laughs> set? What the hell? Tell me how to do shit. Just testing the fucking waters. Yeah, that was uh, real. At least you're not like some of the other directors that make him do it over and over and over again. Right. Um, so the cinematography was done by Jordan Oram. He basically has done a lot of music videos, uh, most notably recently for like Drake and stuff. But he uses a lot of different lenses as well as uh, what's the word for um, filters for this movie? Yeah, definitely. lots of blues and lots of uh, bright. Uh, they oranges. had a color scheme going through all of it. And as well as sometimes using Vaseline on the lenses as well. That's like such cool. an old trick yeah. to use for film. Like uh, I didn't even know if people were still doing it, to be honest, but it's so effective. Uh, the music was done by Charlie Clouser as well as 21 Savage. Nice. Custom song. I'm a huge fan of custom songs for movies. I don't know why we don't do this more often. Probably because they have trouble setting up the contract yeah. with, with people to make a song and then like, Tell him you need a song in like six months. And also, like here's a here here use a sample from one of the older movies. Also, to make your track, which is dope. <laughs> so I was like, this is cool. I like it. Um, the budget for this movie is twenty million. At the box office, it made forty point six million. So it made its money back somehow. It could not fail because it had a huge marketing machine behind it. They like you saw previews for this movie everywhere. Every single social media site you were on, you got a preview for this movie. Yeah, I was in theaters on that day. I watched the movie in theaters. <laughs> I, I I have to admit, because the thing is, we've been hearing about Chris Rock doing a Saw movie for like since 2017. I guess they at a party in Brazil. I think it was a wedding party. Yeah, someone was like, "Yo, you, you want to do a Saw film?" and it, Chris Rock was like, sure. So Dude, then... he spoke directly to the Lionsgate vice chairman at his own <laughs> yeah. fucking wedding. Yeah. <laughs> and was like, I need to make this movie. And he was like, let's do it. And that's literally how it happened. He's, he's basically, he has a lot of roles on this. He is the lead actor, the co-writer, and executive producer. Yeah. So there are a lot of areas of the movie where comedy is thrown in. And you could tell that it's Chris Rock's writing. Yeah, definitely. He's like making fun of cops, basically being like they are like they live the most awful lives. Like they beat their wives. They're going to get divorced. Like, <laughs> I, I don't I, I definitely chuckle when he's like when he's talking about Forrest Gump. Oh I was definitely like, God. holy shit. Like, like, <laughs> literally. <laughs> like, like that's some like Reservoir dog shit where it's yeah, like something that doesn't even matter before they do a heist. Yeah. Yeah. Which was kind of funny to begin with, because I, I was wondering what their plan was. Like, were they just going to drive out of the elevator? Yeah. And like that yeah. was how they escaped. Yeah, because uh, Chris Rock goes undercover with these drug dealers. So funny. Just steals all their money. But prior to that, he has this hilarious conversation how fucking Forrest Gump is a movie about uh, fucking abuse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Literally fucking. Pretty much. What is it? Jenny? Yeah. Is yeah. Fuck Jenny. Who, who's just like, oh, no, I can't be with you, Forrest. And then at the end, when she gets like, fucking oh, AIDS, I have like, AIDS, oh, I can be with you now. And he's like, what the fuck? It's like, no one else wants to be with me, but I know you're still simping. So what's up? Hey, I have AIDS. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I mean, while I was watching this, I was like, he's not wrong. Like, he's totally not wrong. <laughs> fuck. He's like, where's Gump 2? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I need a second movie for yeah, that, honestly. But he's like, he's like, and he's like, yo, it's a nice ending. He's like, nah, it isn't. Where's Gump 2, dog? It somehow <laughs> would not work today to make a movie like that. Oh, fuck no. <laughs> that's what he was saying. He was saying you can't make it because you can't <laughs> stuff like that. Yo. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's literally what he says. You have to say mentally challenged. And he was like, that's the whole point of that. I'm straight up going to put a little bleep <laughs> when you say that <laughs> in, the, in, this, in, the, in this part of the podcast. It's going to be great. I'm quoting, okay? This oh is not my God. real voice. This is not my real, <laughs> not my real voice. <laughs> um, I guess a whole part of the movie also had to be cut due to the MPAA. Yeah. Oh, the skinning scene. The skinning scene. And the, and the trap where someone gets their face ripped off. So I just want to know, who did they actually skin since it wasn't the dude we thought it was? They skinned... Uh, what's his name? They skin, <laughs> they they skin the fu- the the bum who stole the the purse oh, in the first scene. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, yeah, but yeah, what do you guys want to start with? Plot on this shit. <laughs> well, you also have to mention that this does not have Tobin Bell as. Oh Jigsaw. yes, that's he a was big purposely one. left out because they wanted to make a film that existed in the universe but was separate from the original movie so it's not a sequel to anything it exists on its own and they deal with a copycat killer 
It isn't actually Jigsaw himself. And the only reference you get to him is a photograph. There's even like a new little puppet-ish kind of thing. And then he has, um, the only thing I think is the OG mask, the like pig head that he still uses. So it got mixed reviews, obviously, because Chris Rock is the main character. And that's probably the first question I have. Did you like Chris Rock in a horror film? Cause I think I liked it. I think he did well, even though he makes weird faces. I think it's still <laughs> he, he no, makes fa- weird faces. May he makes weird faces all the time. Yeah. And I I'm gonna be the, I'm gonna be this guy. I'm gonna be the party pooper. I did not think he did very well in this movie at all. And there's one scene that sticks out in particular to me. It's when he's sitting, he's standing in the room with Samuel Jackson. They're having a discussion. Yeah. You now know Samuel Jackson's his dad. He's like, I could have killed you. And that was much more believable than anything Chris Rock said in the rest of the movie. Like, he comes it, off very much as this like spoiled brat child. Man. I think that coming from a background of comedy, there's a certain intensity you have to have when you're performing. True. And he brought that same intensity to this role, but I feel like the role that he was taking on is this like investigator. Typically, they're seen as being more cool, level-headed people, but he was kind of a loose cannon, very spiteful. He was quippy. He always yeah. would have something to say during that. And I think that was just a result of him having his comedy instilled into the horror, which is hard to do like to yeah. start with. Yeah. I mean, it's, it seems, it also seems like he's definitely new to this game and it shows, it shows that he's new. He's, he's got some work he's got to do, but I think that there's, I think he has potential. That's what I think. I think that he needs to sit in horror a little bit more maybe, or try another role. Um, uh, Personally, I think he did pretty good. The comedy here made me laugh. And the thing is, at some point, I forget that I'm watching a Saw movie and I'm thinking of like a general in the area of buddy cop movie. It does go into that realm of buddy cop movie with his rookie partner. Right. And so the comedy works really well. But uh, the serious parts, I mean... He has some, like like you said, the facial expressions are very expressive. He has the, like, the expressions that are meant to make you laugh, which are not entirely appropriate for the scene that's happening in front of him, oh. which is usually dark and violent. Yeah, it, I mean, it's dark. You're in, you're in like, a, like, the police headquarters when they're going over crazy murders of them all dying, and then you've got Chris Rock making funny-ass faces and not being quite as... This... I don't know. It just, it just doesn't... It, he, he's trying, you know, <laughs> he's trying real hard, this but it's could just also for me, it ain't working. That we cannot take him out of what we've seen him in typically is comedy. And he's been heavily typecasted as that because that's where he started his career. So it could be that seeing him transition to something completely different is hard in general for us to see him and things like this, because he does have the serious police investigator like demeanor about him, but he's not the typical one you see where like they are cool and collecting and usually like really tough. In this case, he was a smart ass for most of the things and always had something to say. So uh, it kind of changes that perspective. It's like what just Dean said, kind of just um, loose cannony. Cause he, <laughs> would, he would often go on his own to do investigations where he has a cover. Like yeah. there's like, well, there's also the subplot that he told on another cop. So he is not right. liked yeah, in that precinct. Yeah, getting some major Seprico vibes. And if you haven't seen Seprico, Ooh, it's that's about... That's a good reference. Uh, I think Al Pacino was the star of the film. He plays this like hippie kid that grew up in New York and just wants to help his community. So he goes into the police academy, starts to notice some corrupt things happening and snitches on a cop, ends up getting shot. And that's a direct parallel to this movie as well. You have Chris Rock playing this noble cop who is trying to cleanse the the department of all of the crime and he's kind of like trying corruption. to figure he's trying to figure out like how can my team trust me as well as like be there for each other with loyalty and even still though... stand by my own Ooh, morals damn yeah. you you straight up pulled up like an exact analogy to the story that gets created for that mm-hmm. film uh serpico came out in 73 and it's yeah. literally about a cop who won't take bribes and is not mm-hmm. a crooked cop and then gets pretty much like his whole life gets destroyed by the rest of the precinct mm-hmm. who is, uh, who are all crooked cops. So And spoiler, yeah. the movie ends of him ending up getting shot on the job by yeah. somebody they're trying to go after. Same thing happens uh, before the movie really starts of Chris Rock getting shot um, on the job by somebody who is trying to 
catch. Yeah, that's true, huh? Mm -hmm. um, I, and they just didn't respond to his They didn't uh, want to help call. him out. Yeah, they were like, nope. And he, he, uh, Fuck him. he runs in. He's like, what the fuck? He's like, why are none of you answering? Why are none of you answering? pistol whip the person who <laughs> yeah. was on the job with him. That was badass, though. Yeah. He was shit. like, my son called for backup three times within eight minutes, and none of you motherfuckers helped him. That he, was great. He's like, I'm going to call dispatch. We're going to figure out who the fuck was closest. So I will say that they are breaking new grounds by having um, predominantly black characters be the main character and also be in the police force. And the chief of police being a woman of color. Also chief of police being a woman of color. And she's tough. Like she's not a she pushover at all. And is like definitely punishing him at some point because he's just not listening to her. But this also had, of course, the appeal that, you know, fuck cops. And fuck these corrupt cops who are like, so you almost don't feel that bad that like they're getting fucking tortured because they've done terrible things. And then the, even the killer is like, I'm only targeting these people who are doing bad things. I, I feel more bad for the people that get wrapped up in the murders. Like right. the first one where the guy's tied up in the train subway and the subway driver or the train Look, driver yeah, like ends real. up hitting him. That poor driver. I felt so bad traumatized for him. Being for life. traumatized like that. Right. Having a body explode in front of your fucking window. Not cool. It's probably a Monday morning, too. Uh, so I wanted to ask, so then what do you guys think of them creating a story separate from the main storyline of Saw? Do you think they should do more of these? Like, where they explore other things that exist in that universe? I think the Saw series as a whole, one through nine, is too fucking muddled. They, it's been pulled apart to pieces on like YouTube analysis that this story was not cohesive because they didn't keep the same writers throughout the entire yeah that's true series. Well, they I I, I was it was my understanding that they didn't want to make more than like one or two films right, but they were like pressured to keep making them. There was it was even in the marketing if it's Halloween it's Saw. I remember that distinctively because they would release one every Halloween. That's true. They did that for a while. I. I want to. I one thing I want to bring up is I think that the the tortures or the way that people die in this one, I they weren't as satisfying. I would say as like earlier ones, simply because the people that are in these situations, they're always bad people. Right. Usually, they've always done something wrong. But the thing is, like the devices they have are usually they. There's a reasonable way that they can escape from the situation. You know, it's like somewhat reasonable in in like. But in, in like this climbing scale we have in Saw, of oh, what, is, up, what right? is reasonable, yeah. right? But in this one, it feels like the guy, and this is why, and I guess that plays in more with this as a copycat killer because he's not doing it. In my mind, the what I expect from Saw, which is I expect these victims to be either have like, oh, they have a way out. They just have to go through hell to do it. Yeah. But in this one, it's like, okay, you can either die or be paralyzed for the rest of your life. And it's like I and I'm kind of like okay, so there's no way out of this set. So you're just you're just setting up people to die. Oh, I get you. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas like in other ones, it's like dig a key out of your leg. Okay, reasonable. The person could survive this. There's like a moment of hope, but in these ones, I'm just watching. I'm like, this person's just gonna die. They're just yeah, it's they're, like sever your spinal cord, tear yeah. off your fingers, tear yeah. out your tongue. Yeah, oh, that's exactly. True, huh? right. And it's like yeah. you're gonna be paralyzed for life. And I and I think that it's less effective in this movie than it is in previous Saw movies. Well, yeah. yeah. The, well, go ahead. Everybody had something to say. Well, I was just gonna say, reasonably speaking, if you were to tear out your tongue, there's a major artery there, and so you would just bleed out. You would die anyway. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't know. And the others. Well, I wanted to bring this up. Because for the first nine movies they did, they have to have an engineer for everything. They have to have an engineer for these traps for the production, but also it is Tobin Bell who has a degree in engineering behind the traps. Yeah. So this is a guy in the story who basically, you know, knows how everything works, how all these mechanical and electrical things work. So he makes them very realistic. They ask themselves at the prop department, how do we make this as realistic as possible? And so with this, it's a copycat killer. It's some guy that doesn't even have an engineering degree. He's just on a vendetta for his own yeah, personal reasons. Yeah, he was just making up shit on so, how to torture people. The thing is, I think that's the intent. These yeah. are made to not be able to win. Oh, I see. We take a tongue here or there. We break a few yeah, bones Yeah, because he wanted to kill them anyway, he so it's a no-win scenario. He wanted reform for the police, but radical reform for the police. <laughs> <laughs> like, radical. really radical. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> Shaka, bro, radical. Oh, my bro. God. <laughs> Where your thing is at. <laughs> so then this is drastically different than the original idea. Like, in the first film, a woman escapes 
from yes. one of the traps. And afterwards, when they go and interview her, she admits that it actually helped her quit drugs, that she ends up being cured of her addiction because of this near death experience that she has. And that was the thing that they were getting at. Or what Mitch was explaining is that in the original movie, the first one, they had ways to get out. That they could survive like and they would and be three, fine. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they kept they have... it going and then they abandoned it at some point. And then mm -hmm. it ended up just being about how crazy could this thing be and what's going to happen to them. And there was no escape from any the, of it. There is a certain level of degree, too, where some people's tests aren't even their own. Where they're yeah. all set up in these things and it's like they just have to wait for the guy to see if they could make the choice to free them or not. Wasn't it, wasn't there one where it was like a group of people who are together? Yes. It's a, whole, it's a whole precinct for a uh, insurance company. Jeez. That was a uh, saw six. And I well, did not on see the, that one. They're on the spinning carousel and everyone's like, she's, pr I'm pregnant. And they're like, bullshit, you're not pregnant. And they're like trying to make moral decisions. So they know who to kill of one of their coworkers. It's crazy. I remember that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think in regards to your question, I, the the original line of story is too muddled. There's too many things that people have nitpicked where they're just like, there's no way that he could have been here and he could have done that unless he had a helper. Okay, now we're adding in the helper who was actually the guy from this movie. And it's just, it's too muddled. Yeah. So at this point, if we just focus on the book of Saw, like as a standalone, they should make more Saw movies like this but with more copycat killers for their own personal reasons. You could easily make copycat killers who had their sort of own um, set of like quote unquote morals on how they handle the deaths of people. And it would change drastically between each one because that happens in real life. There's a lot of copycats for real serial killers. They'll usually have someone who copies what they're doing and then ruins the investigation as they're trying to find the real one. And so they could definitely play on the idea that Jigsaw is somehow still alive, but he's not because she's been dead for a while in the yeah. series. So it's like that could be something that works well for it. I like the uh, the single targeting of a single precinct. Corrupt. Just a bunch of corrupt cops. These are like really asshole fucking cops. People lying on stand. People shooting innocent he people. He also tried to make it where like it was associated with what they did. Like that dude has his tongue in a vice because he'd been lying on the stand. And so he had like... In his mind, it was like fucked up creative ways to kill people. Like symbolism. Yeah, he like had some sort like, of yeah. symbolism. Yeah, you got to detach um, the tongue that lied so much. The guy that like got that. his fingers ripped off pulled the trigger on an innocent yeah. uh, witness. Right. And then the chief of police got her face melted by hot wax, basically, which I think is sort of maybe like she puts on a face for people, pretends to be this righteous person. Mm. She covers up everything. Yeah, yeah. she covers Ooh. up everything. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so then what do you think worked well for the film what are things that like these things worked well for it and this is kind of what kept it afloat it, it brings up the classic saw squeamishness that oh, yeah. that is in like every single scene so you're like fuck my the, god i have to dig into my leg or there's a lot of good body horror type shit you know what i mean yeah, i and, felt that yeah and they, and they, <laughs> they did that was done really well you know and it's more so like my nitpicks are usually with just like how are the traps designed but then again we're coming back to like like this is the intent this is the intent is that this person doesn't actually know what the fuck they're doing in comparison to Jigsaw previously. Yeah. So it makes sense that granted they're all symbolic, which is following in line with like what Saw movies typically do. You know, there's like a sim there's a little tiny bit of symbology, probably more in your face in this one, I would say much more on the nose. Yeah, I get that. Um, shoot. What were you bringing up prior to that though? Oh, Oh, sorry. Can you repeat the question one more time? What do you think worked well for the okay. film? So for me, it's the cinematography and how they made this stuff more modern. How they, they updated this. You're not getting 2003 shaky cam, fucking just 360 <laughs> view, everything like that. You're getting really good long shots. You're getting really good. Like the long shot where they go down the, the, the uh, tunnel – and he's just like, yeah, my wife does Pilates. And Chris Rock's like, oh, I bet she does. Because <laughs> he's talking about uh, women cheating on police officers. Yeah, they have a whole dialogue between each other as they're going to the crime scene talking about, oh, you're going to get divorced. Like, if you're a cop, you're going to get divorced. <laughs> because <laughs> he's going through a divorce yeah, himself. You're basically guaranteeing yourself you're going to die alone. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, that's the exact line from it, which is so fucked. But also, like, he's totally commenting on real statistics that – that people have pulled from from police i know that was a part that i was sort of like i don't know how to feel about it because on one hand a lot of times when people are going against any sort of anti-police movements they'll bring up statistics like look at the high death rate and the 
divorce rate and the suicide rate. It's just awful what these people go through, but they're also inflicting terror on their communities. Oh, so. yeah. So they're trying to use the um, the idea that all these things happen to them as a reasoning for their behavior in the job. Right. Which is kind of a weak argument to start with because uh, their training already is not very long. Yeah. They get like a short amount of training on how to deal with all these situations. Plus, they don't know how to deal with say like uh, like a social worker would be more prepared for something yeah, like that. Yeah, they're not really good at de-escalating a yeah, situation, which is supposed to be part of the training as to how yeah. to handle things, so resolve things peacefully. This leads right into my question then for you guys is how like how do you feel about the fact that they did target cops in this movie? Like well, this is very blatant. Like they were looking to kill cops in this movie. I like that they don't grab the random junkie off the street. They don't do like, oh, you you were a bad person. You killed someone with your car vehicle. They're targeting people who are corrupt cops, specifically in a distinct precinct, because they're, it is known and thrown out in the film that every cop in this area was working under Article 8. And so oh, Article, right. Article 8 was something that they used to put a heel on the community because crime was so high that the cops basically had the keys to the, king, uh, the city to basically do whatever corrupt shit they wanted to, and everyone got away with it. So for me, it it's feels like justice served. And that the intent was there for the killer. And he had his own personal reasons because his father was innocently killed by uh, Chris Rock's previous partner, uh, Levy. Yeah. So it was cool to see that all happen um, because it's very relevant today. Like corrupt cops should get their just punishment. Yeah, I've seen I've seen a lot of criticism <clears throat> for the film saying that it was too heavy handed, especially towards the end when his dad just straight up gets like shot i don't know how many times that was insane which is like well he had he's tied up and then the he's like a puppet basically and they put a gun on him so that he would get shot after shooting at the cop so it ends up being that kind of ending but any criticism i've seen of course is that the argument is not every cop is going to be crushed but then you have the other side of that argument is Am I going to take the off chance the, that they're not? The, the movie's not even, not even, not even saying that. It's saying this True. precinct this is the one that's corrupt, and this. It's, so it's not even saying that. So even saying that, like this movie is saying blah blah blah. Yeah. It doesn't even explicitly say it. it. Says that there are corrupt police and they need to be punished. Yeah, that's the truth. True. Deal with it. The scope of it was actually pretty good as far as that it wasn't the entire police force. So they weren't having all of these cops going and then getting killed for no reason, which I think does happen at some point. Detectives get killed in another Saw movie. They do. There's one throwaway line where fucking his partner asks him, yeah, well, why do you think they're targeting cops? And then Chris Rock's like, Jigsaw would never target cops. I'm like, dude, have you seen any of the other movies? They, they are, get it's literally all they do. Yeah. Well, usually it was because they were like finding his hideout and he had set up traps for them, yeah. including the one we talked about, the there, shotgun. There's at least five police officers that got fucking axed in the original series. Yeah. And, but usually when they got too close, you're right. like, oh shit. So definitely something that happened. It is hard though, because then you get into the idea of, uh, is it okay for a vigilante to take that sort of justice into their hands this is like the whole punisher argument of why people like mm -hmm. him and don't like him because the punisher is a cop killer and then he Absolutely. somehow got changed into a representative symbol for the right for the far right, which shit. is weird so much so he had to change his logo which is intense it's, it's annoying to me to see like confederate flags of like punisher on yeah, it. i'm just weird. like did, did you read the did you read the comics at all yeah man government killed his family he fucking went on a <laughs> rampage after that yeah. <laughs> He killed gangs and cops at the same time. Wild. Um, so, yeah, that was that was one of the things I had been thinking about, too. This is also a hilarious argument about, like, whether or not Batman is is needed. Because he <laughs> ends up just being a vigilante who can do more help other ways. As like, literally giving money. He's literally, like, a billionaire. He yeah, can easily so funny. fund more projects around the community to help better people's way of life. But instead, he's just letting out his sad, you know... Daddy right. issue anger. Oh, uh, really conflicting. As far as me watching this film, while I do totally understand that they were not going to get some sort of justice without this guy doing things, you also get the impression that, of course, it's not a good thing to do. So what do you do? Because this is people who deal, like, say, with the current system we have where we know things might not happen. And you see a lot of people walk free. But if you yourself decide to do something illegal, you might actually get the hammer coming down on you and you'll go to prison for it. So it's like the, it's such a hit and miss on the system that we currently work in that you don't know how to respond to some of these situations. 
something that's not explored or it is vaguely tried to be hinted at is that uh, the chief of police is the one who's pulling the strings. Also, yeah, they, they really kind of hid it under a few layers of what's going on. But it did seem like, she, of course, she covered up most of it, but it was also the one who told people to do certain things. Right. There's all these hints that, like, they even start turning on uh, uh, Chris Brock, and they're like, where was the last time you saw your dad? Yeah. He's like, this morning, like, bullshit, dude. Yeah. Like, there's you know, too for many... the longest time, I thought it was his dad that was doing the killings because he was trying to get revenge for the injustice against his son. I thought it, too. It yeah. kind of makes sense. It kind of does. But no, it was closer to him the whole time. Now, that one thing that, that definitely ruins the twist is that we don't see the trap with the skinning. Um, where That's they true. Where they yeah. find Detective Shank, quote unquote. Um, simply because the MPAA did couldn't do that because they wanted to put it in an NC-17 rating uh, mm. for that movie if they were going to leave it in there. Understandably and they, so. They knew that they would lose a lot of revenue if they did that. Oh, dang. So they had to cut out that entire trap. And Justine was bringing it up to me. I didn't think about this, but like, what did the new cop do? He just got on the force like two days ago. Right, because all of the killings that had happened before were somehow justified by something that that person had done prior. But this guy's brand new to the force doesn't really know how things are going at least pretends that he doesn't know so like what could he have possibly done to get murdered and i was like you know i wouldn't put it past the killer just to start killing everybody around them but at the same time the killings were way too intentional like he wouldn't just do something randomly yeah so that's like kind of one of the first notes and then you finally get the the twist at the end if you could call it that (laughs) (laughs) where uh, detective shank is just like i want you to be my partner I want to take out the system. You just show me who the bad cops are. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's true. I didn't think about that, too. Huh. They also have a good callback to the first movie where they give him the saw and he's handcuffed to the pipe. Oh, right. You think he's going to cut it open, but I'm pretty sure that bobby pin was put there intentionally. Oh, yeah, to give him a chance to like get out and everything. That fucking glass cannon thing that they made for that was fucking intense, too. That was cool. I liked that one. Like creative as far as like w- what you've seen so far there are some of them that stick out to you like when you've watched the previous films i also love the uh the killer using like um the blue boxes to like show show different hints and like little riddles and stuff like that and he always has the flash drive with <coughs> with the monotone voice you know what's funny too is those boxes are tiffany blue Ooh, what they really mean? are, yeah. Yeah, Tiffany, the diamond company, they have this signature blue that they put on all of their boxes. They've uh, trademarked the color. They are the only company allowed to use it for their packaging, and, and you'll so know So now it. I'm wondering what the symbology is behind that, because I feel like there's something more to that box. Ooh. Any thoughts? I don't, I'm not As far as, like, what company. he, I, I always took it as that he was, like, <laughs> he, was, he was giving them the evidence they needed. He was wrapping it up nice like a bow and then gives you that. Cause that's how they usually refer to cases where things just fell on their lap and they were mm-hmm. able to get those. Like somebody handed it to them as a gift. But yeah, here you go. That, I'm not sure. like, oh, these, this is a tongue. All right. <laughs> yeah. Literally it's their it's body like, parts. It's a doll made out of human skin. Oh, Yo, that was wild. Yeah. Also, the, uh, I do need to mention that the, the new puppet that they made for this movie has a name. It does. <laughs> Mr. Snuggles. Mr. Snuggles. Which is awful. <laughs> The Uncle Sam pig. Yeah, he's he, he's a little he's a pig in a suit, you know. <laughs> nice, <laughs> like that analogy. Um, there is also um, a bit of production about the voice. They weren't sure which voice to go with for the new copycat killer, and that literally was chosen two days before they finished the sound mixing. I kind of like it. I like the use of flash drives and all this stuff because it it modernizes the. The cut and paste that we see with Saw. Right, because what did you have before? It was the little tapes, right? They still use the tapes, but uh, the thing is, like, now... It was a voice recording, though. Voice recording on a cassette player. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't an actual video, unless they wanted you to see it while you were there. And so, it's really really cool to see everything get modernized. The, The look of the movie with the blues and the yellows and oranges gives it kind of, like, a mood. We don't... We're never to- uh, told where the setting is, but I can only imagine somewhere in, in a metropolitan place, maybe in the south or something, because there's a fucking heat wave and shit. That's true. They are complaining about how hot it is all over, which was... I didn't see how it fit into any part of the plot besides that it was just hot. Well, just generally, whenever there is a heat wave going on, especially in big cities, there is an increase in crime because oh, it's right. actually related that the temperature can cause people to be more agitable. 
And so a lot of times you'll see a spike in crime during heat waves. Just agitated as fuck. Mm-hmm. And I think the last part of production, or last two, I think, is that I know that they made the tunnel for the tunnel scene all by themselves. Like, they basically Insane. made that. And they had to use one side of the tunnel for both both sides of the shots. So they eventually got a matte painter for the background of the tunnel. Oh, damn. And then, then they used forced perspective and angles to make it look like a train was coming one way. And then I know that the guy... Do you guys remember the scene where they're basically trying to find Benny Rice and they, they go to the dealer's house and they yeah. fuck with him so hard? Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess uh, the the director loves watching magic videos on YouTube for, like, magicians. And so that guy is, like, a, U- a famous YouTuber that does uh, magic tricks. Oh my God. And he wanted him to just be the drug dealer for that scene and he was like dude they i had to break my leg like four or five times on set over and over again like every day and they let him keep the mold which was super cool and he has he's like yeah it smells like my fucking leg oh weird <laughs> what the fuck that's such a weird bit of the production <laughs> yeah the guy just really liked that youtuber and wanted him to be in his movie it just it happens like that yeah did you guys have any favorite scenes then Damn, finger ripping scenes, pretty amazing. <laughs> Fuck yeah, that's Brutal. that's 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 like the most fucked up shit. Just... You got you got to describe the trap for people who haven't seen it. Oh yeah, so basically he's what is he? He's in water. He's got a big cage on his head. Uh, the water's rising, so he's probably gonna drown or be shocked. She'd be shocked to death because it's rising up to electric wires, and then he has to rip his fingers off by biting down. On by something. biting down, yeah, by biting down. So he has to incur, yeah. So he has to bite down, and then his fingers get ripped off, and. It is gnarly to watch Which that I'm hand. I'm just saying, that's a hard way to rip off your fingers because already that's painful. So you want to scream in response, but you have to keep biting down in order to rip the fingers Yeah, off. this wasn't like a clean cut scenario where you that, just get to chop them off. That was the whole reason that he lost the game too because he let out a scream for like 30 seconds. Yeah. yeah. And ended up not winning the game. I mean, he probably would have lost anyway. Like, or bled <laughs> there out. There was no way. Yeah, there's no way he was going to get out of that one. Right. He kind of set him up just for sure to die in that trap. Same with, like, the wax trap. Same yeah, there's with, no same escaping with that. that shit. It's just like, you're, they're not going to live through this. They're just not going to. That's that. Uh, I'll probably go with the probably the most fucked up one, which is there's nothing like a flayed man in any film that because it's always disturbing it's been done in history for punishments and it's always memorable so it's like that is fucked up and i understand why they were like we got to take some of this shit out and lower the rating because to get that nc-17 rating you have to do some fucked up shit in movies oh i'm sure we'll get like a director's cut that's an nc-17 rating with an extra scene in it or something i'm sure we'll get something like that I think my favorite scene was Samuel Jackson pistol whipping a dirty cop. Yo. (laughs) Purely for satisfaction reasons. He looks so pissed. Yeah. (laughs) True. That dumbass cop. I I like seeing them writhe. Yeah. And he has a scar on his face from that day, too, which is satisfying. Yep. He's always going to remember that shit. Uh, For me, it is uh, watching Chris Rock do impersonations. So him pretending to be the uh the robber and then him pretending to be a junkie so he could do the oh the that's whole right interrogation oh that, hell yeah that's that, so fucking funny <laughs> the whole scene's like i'm trying to give you an ipad but it won't fit in the box let me come up and he's like nah fuck you Yo, great piece of acting right there yeah like everything down to him just doing this little hop dance down below while he's pulling up the bucket <laughs> yeah and he takes a selfie with the guy's fractured leg oh my god um, for me it's just like that scene is really well done and you could see the moral question in shank too because he's like don't we need a permit for this shit? Yeah, he's, he's like, like, you don't need a fucking warrant like to go into this guy's that, house. I mean, that that whole scene with the with him pretending to be a drug dealer and stuff. That's like him being like, I feel like that's like him in his element at that yeah, moment. Like, definitely. I'm being comedic, but I'm also being kind of like a little bit serious. You know what I mean? And that's kind of where Chris Rock's been for a while, and it was yeah. clear like it's clear that he's like is good in that. He was good. In, he was good with the buddy cop stuff. I could. I felt yeah. like it was very believable, and uh, I I honestly felt that the relationship that Shank and him had was very bromancy and oh were, it was they were getting there he actually cares about him yeah <laughs> <laughs> so i i like that stuff i mean what chris rock in a lethal weapon movie he was in four he was in four he was yeah. in lethal weapon four i did yeah. not know that yeah. i had no idea he was in, well there you go makes sense then there you go yeah. i think yeah. so i'm actually not sure really <laughs> yep it's chris rock like i'm like i didn't even know that i didn't know that i also really appreciate just i don't know 
the cinematography. It yeah. doesn't look like a Saw film. It looks like some, they're trying to go for something more updated. Uh, points to 21 Savage, too. That guy fucking spit on that track. Mm. Oh, <laughs> wild. Yeah, he was in Lethal Weapon 4 as Lee Butters. <laughs> I don't know how to feel about that. Um, yeah, weird. Also, Danny Glover. So It's already, oh, it's already <laughs> a thing. Well, question. Would you guys be open to seeing more iterations that aren't of the main story of saw if they said the book of saw is going to be something we do every now and then uh yeah they should probably let, uh, open it up and let some other directors come in and try to do something with it yeah it's it's like saw is one of those things where i knew exactly what i was going to get also, when i came into this movie i'm going to get a little bit of side drama and we're going to get some some kills and they're going to be like squeamish and like gunt wrenching kills like they're going to be gnarly what would you guys rate the film I give it a six. Hey, I give you applause for making it through it because I know you're yeah, not going to Yeah, I <laughs> do not like Saw movies. I watched them when I was way too young and was emotionally scarred. Like, I don't mind gore, traditional killings, but it's the torture gore that I just, there's something about it I can't stand to watch. So I never like these movies. My opinion's probably very biased in that case. But I will say that the kills are interesting, which props them for that. I like some of the political commentary, but I think if you're really going to make a political movie, you got to dive a little deeper into it. But, you know, still entertaining to watch. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> uh, so, um, I uh, unfortunately, my girlfriend watched this with me. She was not a fan. <laughs> um, we, we just kind of laughed about Chris Rock's faces that he made all the time, and then she would just turn away during all the torture parts. But I'm I'm thinking like six point five or seven maybe for this maybe a seven because because there's a couple things where I'm like okay I, I see why they went the route with how they did the killings and everything but honestly I feel like I feel like we don't need more Saw movies <laughs> I, I, I think I think that. I think we've done I think we've done <laughs> nine of them and the idea has and you can see like torture porn like this and like hostile. Yeah. And like shit like that. You know, there's tons of other movies that are doing this also. And I don't know if we need them, but also what Justine's saying, if you want to do a political thing, you got to go a little deeper. True. Then it's just sort of like, I feel like they only put that in there to appeal to the audience at the time. And it's really just an audience like favoritism sort of thing. There's not really anything deeper behind that they're trying to appeal to the audience, get more box office views. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go with like a six. It's uh it's it's entertaining at like the very least. Um I liked Chris Rock in the role and I think he should keep doing it, but chances are that he probably won't. <laughs> I, I don't think he's terrible. Right. I just think he needs some more time. Yeah. He needs exactly. to practice a bit I more, agree. he needs to work at it more. He needs That's a little it. more time That's for it. it. I don't think um, he's terrible. They like dipped slightly into political commentary, but it wasn't deep enough. It, so it would make sense for that. political commentary. Yeah, maybe, so but. definitely something they can explore. More saw films, eh. We can go without him. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't be upset if a new one came out, but it's also like at this point, you probably wouldn't be very successful with making them because people are kind of moved on. Ironically, we're like tapping into the A24 films that people are really starting to dig. And so that is like the new thing, like very indie horror films are like starting to become very prominent. And that's sort of where we're shifting to. Yeah. So that's kind of a cool thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. If I'm drunk, this is like an eight. If I'm, <laughs> watching this on my own it's like a seven seven point five fair I, the thing is like i grew up on all these movies so for me there's a little bit of a bias because i feel a personal connection to liking mm -hmm. them uh i also played all the games so oh gotcha. i just really like the franchise as a whole there are saw games yes <laughs> yeah they're no fucked. idea that i had that there were saw games <laughs> oh hi man you got to look into that god i guess i have to go play saw Way games to traumatize now. yourself honestly um, oh. for me it's always the twists and always the uh the elaborate traps that keep it going but for me the soundtrack and i like chris rock doing something horror for once uh I watched this movie and I thought the humor fell flat when I saw it in theaters. And then I watched it again for this viewing and it was still funny to me. I was laughing a lot. So it did good on the comedy aspect, but I'm, I'm biased to the, the franchise as a whole. Cinematography is good. I love the filters that they use over this because the lighting sets a, a specific mood that is so different from the original stuff. Cause it's all greens 
and blacks and grays. That's true. They use a lot of green. <clears> so this, they were like, let's make it colorful. Let's have fun with it. I think they could probably do, if not for like movies, they could probably adapt this into something like for Netflix, maybe a TV series. I'm surprised there hasn't been a TV show. Maybe an animated show. It. Maybe maybe we're past the time for Saw movies and more of yeah. adaptations. Well, TV has become prominent. In right. the last year, because of the, of the pandemic, they were just making TV shows. You know, so saw many. TV series could be maybe get cool. get some get a bunch of directors to do different series Ooh, on it. Yeah, that'd For, be cool. If we nice continue an- anthology of if stuff, we, if we drop the John Kramer storyline <laughs> and just go off from the book of Saw, yeah, we could probably see some very creative things come out of the woodwork. Interesting. So seven point five, seven. All right, but yeah, are we? We good with that? That's about it. Yeah, we're yeah. just wrapped right. up. Solid. Thank you. Thank you for checking this out. This is uh, episode two of season three. We're going off the chains this year. New, Woo! Year. new content. We got new segments. Hey. Gonna talk about sci-fi. Gonna talk about games, monsters, cryptids, conspiracies, anime, weeb shit, hand to- no, Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> There is. Uh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> We're bringing down the Grindhouse, a podcast that discuss horror and media. Thank you for listening to this episode. Make sure to check out all of this stuff. And what is that stuff? We have our Patreon. For, for $2 a month, we can recommend horror media for us to review, as well as check out all of our bonus content that we do right now currently on Patreon. You can also check out our Teespring, where we have merch, we have cups, shirts, with all sorts of different designs, and Wear that swag. That shit's dope. Check out our socials, the Twitters, Instagrams, and the Facebooks. Give us a like and a follow. Make sure to review us on Apple Podcasts, as well as give us a follow on Spotify and Apple Podcasts so you can be notified whenever new episodes drop. We're getting on top of our shit this year. We're doing more. <laughs> yeah, people definitely. want more, and we're going to give them more. So Give the people what they want. Yeah. Is it art? Is it content? I don't know. Debate it. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Right. I'm out. Grab your shoes. Yeah, I got them. Oh, you Does got anyone your shoes see already? my glasses? Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, I found them right here. You can't oh, see you. without your glasses. Yeah, here, here you go. <laughs> oh, God. Jinkies. Jinkies. John, did you get your coat? It's cold out. <laughs> yes. Get your fingers gloves. I'm very cold. Yeah, it's very cold. Yeah, All house right. House slippers. Yeah. Good, 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 good. All right. I'm Mitch. I'm Murph. I'm Justine. And I'm Jonathan. Thank you. Woo! <laughs>